أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وطبيب نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لمقدمه الفداء Respected brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi alladhi hadana lihada wa ma kunna linahtadiya lawla an hadana Allah. Ya ilahi wa sayyidi wa rabbi aturaka muaddibi binarika ba'da tawheedik. و بعد من طوى عليه قلبي من معرفتك. We are reflecting on this part of the heavenly supplication of Amir al-Mu'minin sallallahu alayhi known as Dua Kumail. And again before I delve into this part of the Dua, I must tell you that last night that I was preparing my, my speech for tonight, I, I cannot just help it even though I know that I have mentioned this several times, but it's natural. When you see a beauty, you have to praise it, isn't it? Subhanallah, every time I'm really and sincerely, God is my witness, I tell myself, speed up, it's getting so long, this uh, tafsir of uh, series on uh, tafsir dua kumail, but I just cannot, it is just impossible. The density of the words of Amir al-Mu'mineen, sallallahu alayhi, without any exaggeration, this is, we are talking about an ocean. If you want to fly over an ocean, yes, inshallah, soon, within half an hour, we go through and read through the Dua Kumail. But if you want to discover the pearls of wisdom in this heavenly Dua, it's just impossible to be fast and quick because the information in, in it is just unbelievable. The wordings, what I'm, I'm saying that like last night when I was, and it's definitely not the first time, and what I'm saying is not only about Dua Kumail, all the supplications of Ahlul Bayt Salam, what I'm going to say applies to all of them. Now we are talking about the Akumel, and therefore I mentioned the Akumel. The wordings of the Akumel is so miraculously and so eloquently put together that I, I kid you not that if an assembly of Arab linguists they get together and they want to develop something like this is impossible. It's just impossible. Let alone that Amir al Salamullah alai, has been saying this to Akumel spontaneously. As Khomeil ibn Ziyad narrated, Imam Ali is just in the position of sajda or standing up. However, he was reciting this dua. He, it's, the wars are just coming. And now that when you review it, when you see that, subhanAllah, possibility of having another war synonym to this, possibility of having another proposition, when you consider all the possibilities and why Imam chooses this wording, these propositions, is nothing less than a miracle. I'm 100% convinced that the supplications of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt is definitely inspiration. And they were 100% inspired. The way that I put it is just like this. I'm paraphrasing it. Excuse my example just to bring it closer to the mind. It's just like at the time of the dua, Imams of Ahlul Bayt, in our example, Amirul Mu'minin, is connected to the realm of divinity and all such beautiful information, words of wisdom are poured into his soul and as Imam is downloading them, he is verbalizing them. And Kumail ibn Ziyad has been taking notes, writing them down and by the grace of God we have access to it. There is no any other explanation. It cannot be any other explanation because even if you think you are, some of you, you are writing, we are writing, you know, we prepare our speech, you write something, you read the book, the second edition of the book is different from the, th the first edition. The third edition, sometimes if a book goes to the five and the sixth, the fifth of sixth edition, completely a different book. Because every time we, uh, I don't like this word, I want to change it, isn't it? You change a sentence, you change the paragraph altogether. But how can someone without any preparation come with such miraculous wordings? So the wordings are so beautiful that you are so infatuated that you just enjoy the sound of it. And you are sometimes contemplating, I, I don't know, pay attention to the wordings or to the context, to the meaning that the Imam is, is delivering, all beautiful, all beautiful. 
that reminds me of what Ibn Abdul Hadid, that famous Sunni scholar, and he's talking about Nahjo Balagh. And with all respect, the level of Dua Kumel is higher than Nahjo Balagh because the addresses of Nahjo Balagh were ordinary people. Laymen sit in front of Amir al Mu'minin, whereas the addressee of Dua Kumel is the Almighty God. So Imam Ali alayhi salam, when he is supplicating, he is being himself. He is not diluting his knowledge. Yet Ibn Abdul Hadid, he says that some of the sermons of Amir al Mu'minin, it's if it was permissible to prostrate before, I would prostrate before it. It is so accurate, really. It is really true. So admirable. By the way, let's go back uh, with this preparation to tell you that why I'm saying this. Amir al Mu'minin, Salamullah alayhi, in this part of the Akumel, is introducing to us numbers of fire extinguishers. I'm not talking about New South Wales bushfire, obviously. This is fire with capital F and talking about the real fire of the hellfire. How we can extinguish the hellfire so that, as I quoted before, the Rawayat says, inshallah, by the time that we expire from this dunya and we go through the, the bridge of uh, that Sarat, just now, wa hiya khamida. Inshallah, you pass through the hellfire while the hellfire was extinguished peace and cool for you and you pass through. We have to extinguish our hellfire, each and every one of us in this world. Imam says that the very first one was to spend your lifetime and it's worth it and more to earn and to learn about Tawheed and the monotheism and the unity of God. A heart in which there is Tawheed will not be burned by the hellfire. And then Imam is reinforcing this with the second paragraph. وَبَعْدَ This is what we want to reflect tonight. وَبَعْدَ مَنْ طَوَى عَلَيْهِ قَلْبِي مِنْ مَعْرِفَتِكِ The second fire extinguisher Imam says that let me just explain the wording and then inshallah we delve into it to, to discover the pearls of wisdom. In tawa in Arabic language, especially when it is used with the preposition of ala, you know how in English sometimes, depending on the preposition, the meaning of a verb changes. Look at is different from look out, complete different. It's look, but at or out makes a different meaning. In Arabic, we have this as well. In tawa, if it is used with the preposition ala, as the mom is using it here, that's what I told you that it's just like hours of hours of someone has been reflecting to collect these words together. In tawa ala, it means tadamana, it means to comprise, it means encompasses, engulf, something that is engulfing, comprising, and uh, like uh, encompassing. Uh, imagine that you, you put a, a, a piece of cloth on the top of the floor of this hole that covers the whole area of the hole. Nowhere, there is nowhere uh, uh, empty. Completely covered. This is called entawa alay. Inshallah, I could explain it literally. The Imam says, وَبَعْدَ مَنْ طَوَى عَلَيْهِ and عَلَيْهِ the Dhamir, the pronoun goes back to the Tawheed. Meaning that your Tawheed, my, and I tell you how, it has encompassed, engulfed, captured my heart, captured my soul with a tool of intuitive cognition, intuitive knowledge, in a special time, it's not just knowledge. Imam is using the term ma'rif and that's what we want to discover and reflect on, on tonight inshallah to see what the Imam is perhaps talking about and he knows best about uh, his words. In, uh, uh, if you go to the translations of the Akumail or usually the translations from Arabic to English, normally you see that translators, they don't distinguish between these two Arabic terms, ilm and ma'rifah. Even if you, if you have access to translation of the Akumail, later on you can check it and I've checked it. I bet you they have translated what Imam says here, ma'rifah to knowledge. But knowledge is for ilm. Ma'rifa is not knowledge. Ma'rifa is a much higher level of knowledge. I will ex inshallah explain it with that there are differences between al-ilm and ma'rifa and inshallah we'll see if possible for us to translate this part of the argument. Brothers and sisters, when we are talking in Arabic language, when we use the term al-ilm, ayn, lam and meme, we use it for things that it is possible to have a comprehensive knowledge about. A, a, a programmer, for example, he says that, look, I know about this program that I've developed inside out. 
a carpenter he says I know about carpentry inside out and therefore he can use the term alim alim to alam I know this profession inside out okay so one point is that we use the term alim in Arabic for something that in com that comprehensive knowledge about it is possible whether I have it or not that's a different story whereas ma'rifa in Arabic is used for things that is impossible to have the full knowledge about it's just impossible it is not within ability of man to have full knowledge about therefore note in Arabic it is incorrect to say alimtullah it's, it's not eloquent it's not correct Arabic it's not correct to say alimtullah but you can say araftullah see why because if I say alimtullah I'm claiming that I know God fully comprehensively inside out that is impossible but araftullah it means that within my ability I have some knowledge about God that is correct subhanallah do you see this one Second difference between ilm and ma'rifah that is very important for what we want to deliver here is that al-ilm is used when there are intermediaries between the knower and the known. I hope I'm not getting too uh, uh, technical. Please be with me. The, when, and that's what we call it in logic, ilm al-husuli, acquired knowledge. Now you see me through intermediaries. Your eyes is an intermediary. Brain is intermediary. The, the, uh, the camera is intermediary. Likewise, when I see you, the, my image is reflecting on your brain. Brain cells, there are numbers of intermediaries. God knows what you see is really uh, seeing is, uh, is truth or not. That's why often we have illusions that leads to delusion. Huh? When we, have, we make mistakes in our seeing. So, uh, al-ilm is used when there are intermediaries between the knower, al-alim, and the known, al-ma'loom. Ma'arifa is not like this. When you have ma'arifa about something, and that's what the imam is using, the term that the imam is using, you know, why I say it's miraculous, the choice of the words. وَبَعْدَ مَنْ قَوَى عَلَيْهِ قَلْبِي مَنْ مَعْرِفَتِكَ First of all, the tool of ma'arifa is the heart, human soul, not the eyes. Not the ears, these are physical, these are for, for ilm, not for ma'rifa. The second, the imam is using the term ma'rifa, meaning that, Ya Rab, between the tawheed that has encompassed my heart, captured my heart, there is no intermediaries. How could it be possible? Is this possible to get to know God without any intermediaries? Allahu Akbar. This is the beautiful part. Some of you have been with us, inshallah, or if you have been doing the Ihauze diploma, I remember many years ago when we were talking about philosophy of religion, I mentioned the simile of the cave of Plato. Plato presents that to my interpretation, and perhaps that's what he meant as well. When he wants to explain the ascension and the mi'raj of the prophets, he brings that uh, simile of the cave. That long story short, there were a number of prisoners in a cave, and one was released, goes out, sees the reality, comes back, and informs the rest. Muslim mystics, they say, with all respect to Plato, this is not what happened to the prophets. It's not that the prophets, especially the holy prophet of Islam, it's not that he went out of the world of matter, saw the reality, saw things that has been narrating to us, and came and told us, no. The, the, the real mi'raj is they became unified. It was in unity with the reality. And they became real. I'll, I'll explain to you this, inshallah, soon. And when they came back, it's just they became a fire and brought that fire back. Better to use nur. They became illuminated and brought that nur back with them because they, they become nur themselves. And that's the, the expression Quran is using. One of the best uh, similes that for this expression of ma'rifah we have in our uh, mystical literature, I, I, to my knowledge, to my research, it started with that controversial uh, Sufi mystic, his name was Hallaj, and then Abtar developed it in a very poetic way. I really urge you, if you get a chance to read this book, even if you, you know that to learn about Islamic mysticism, you, apart from Arabic, besides Arabic, you need to know uh, Farsi as well, because still we have a lot of masterpieces in Islamic mysticism in Farsi language. 
Attar is a very famous Iranian poet of about 800 years ago or so. He has a poetry book called Mantegutay. It's translated, in fact, it has more than one translation in English. And translated as Conference of the Birds. Some translators are translated as the speech of the, the birds. He has taken the name of his book exactly from an ayah in Surah An-Naml in the story of Prophet Suleiman, Ullimna Mantagatayr. By the way, he says that in your journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is on practical mysticism, practical irfan. He says in your journey towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are valleys that you have to pass. Rahmatullah alayhi, Imam Khomeini. Who is Imam Khomeini? Yet Imam Khomeini says, Haft shahr ish ra attar gash ma hanuz and dar khami ye kucha am nistim. He says, Attar has passed the seven valleys of practical mysticism. I'm not still in the first one. I have not even been able to pass the first one. Think about it. When he takes you to the story of the seventh valley, that is the valley of annihilation, and, and completely becoming nothing, of, there is no me, myself, and I anymore existing, egotism completely dissolves and destroys, he puts this uh, parable, this example, this simile, that I tell is better than the simile of Plato, Allah Akbar. Very quickly, I hope I can explain it. I thought, I borrowed it from uh, Hallaj, of course, in a poetic way. He says that, look, once upon a time, there was an assembly of the butterflies. And now you follow this later on in, uh, in the mystical uh, terminology. Butterflies and candle, parvane and sham, is what, how they are expressing, expressing that simile. He says, Yek shabi parvanegan jam amadan, dar maziqi talib sham amadan. He says, once upon a time, a, 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 an assembly of the butterflies, they got together in a dark area, and a small area. This is an expression for dunya. Dar maziqi talib sham amadan. They said, we are in, in quest of light. We have to find that candle. Remember, in the old days, artificial light would be like candles. He said, we are in, in quest of light. Candle. Somebody has to go. Somebody has to go and get us some news about light. We want to know what the light is all about. You know that in summer season now, even if you don't have uh, like, uh, uh, what do you call it, mosquito nets or uh, fly nets, Fly, uh, flies, mosquitoes will come in because they are in quest of light. Like us humans, by the way, as well. So what happens is that شد یکی پروانه تا قصری زدور در فضای قصر یافت از شم نور One of the butterflies, he said, I'm going to take the challenge. He flew all the way to a palace. Palace is an expression in that simile for the world beyond this physical world. He goes to the palace and sees all the illuminated rooms and charmers because of the candles. So through that, he got to the knowledge that there is a candle. This is what we call it later on, Elm el yaqeen Through the signs, you get to know about God. He returned from his journey and started writing down his experience. Like someone who had a dream and now is writing his dream sharing it with others among the butterflies there is one that atta refers to hudhud in arabic also we call it hudhud farsi hudhud in english they call it that uh, historical but hupo okay he was the most learned he said that look i'm not satisfied with this knowledge i don't want this type of knowledge that you are bringing the news of what you have through what i want more in depth information شد یکی دیگر گذشت از نور در خیش را بر شم زد از دور در another butterfly he went further up he went further up to the palace got so close to the candle and with the with his wings he touched even the flame of the candle and felt the heat of the candle imagine now if you want to think about the bushfire someone who is like those uh, fire extinguishers there that they feel the heat of the bushfire in the bush their, their understanding of the fire is obviously different from you who are just watching the, the sky and figure it out that there must be fire around, okay? That one also returned. That butterfly also returned and also told us some secrets. God knows what they were. Maybe some of them didn't make so much sense to us. 
I'm telling you the story of the levels of the ascension and the mi'raj to reach to ma'rifah. Attar says that is still not ma'rifah. Now you see what Imam Ali alayhi salam says, that my heart is encompassed with the ma'rifah. What is ma'rifah? The third one that we refer to it as haqqul yaqeen. The third butterfly goes in that simile and what happens? He flew through the castle, palace got close to the, uh, to the candle of, of light and sat right on the top of it. Use the fuel, by the way, inshallah, if I'm alive and around next week, I will introduce the fuel to you. Again, from the uh, Dua Kumail. Use that uh, fuel that I will mention it to you now until he reached to the right to the top of the flame of the, of the uh, candle and sat on the candle. Naturally, what happens? The, the flame of the fire of the candle burned this butterfly from top to toes. That butterfly annihilated. This is what we want. And that butterfly no longer existed himself, herself, but became fire. Because it was burnt by fire, became fire. And as such carried the properties of fire. Fire burns, now this butterfly burns. Fire has certain uh, uh, properties, this butterfly also has, because he's no longer butterfly himself. Maramayta is Ramayta, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Maramayta is Ramayta, walakin Allah Rama. This hadith, both Shia and Sunni have narrated it. I quote it from one of the most authentic books of the Shia that we have, Kitab al Kafi, that Imam Sadr quoted from his uh, grandfather, the Holy Prophet, and the Holy Prophet from the Almighty God. Hadith al Ghulsi. Al Abd yataqarrabu ilayya bin Nawafil. By doing the Mustahabad, you slowly but surely, inshallah, you get closer to God, says the Almighty God. Hatta uhibbahu. This is for next week, inshallah. Until I love it. And when I love it, kuntu sam'ahu alladhi yasma'u bi. I become his ears by which he listens. When Amir al Mu'min says, Ana yadullah, Ana aynullah, this is because of the ma'rifah. Because the Imam here says, Wa ba'da man tawa alayhi qalbi min ma'rifatik. Your intuitive cognition has encompassed my heart, captured my heart. That is no longer me, it's you. I'm talking, but when I'm talking, says Amir al Mu'min, it's God's talking. Ma yantiqa an al hawa in huwa illa wahyun yuha. The hadith the Qudsi are finished and inshallah I don't want to keep you long. Hatta kuntu samahu alladhi yasma'u bih wa basaruhu alladhi yubsiru bih wa lisanahu alladhi yantiqu bih He speaks but he speaks what I want him to say. Wa yadahu alladhi yabtishu biha His hand becomes the hand of God, the power of God. Removes the, the khaybar. It's not a human hand. Who removes the khaybar? It is the hand, it is Yadullah and Qubatullah and the might of God. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us to inshallah reflect and understand this such an amazing, beautiful heavenly dua of Kumail. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ala aswatikum.